we've just talked about some of the mathematics behind gradient boosting. And now it's time to try our hand at a little bit of uh, scikit-learn code. Now, the book has some nice examples uh, using one-dimensional feature spaces. My example also will work uh, in one-dimensional uh, on that input space. Uh, that just makes it a lot easier for us to visualize what's going on. But in general, of course, we can uh, have many dimensions as inputs to the feature spaces. The gradient boosting regressor class is a, an ensemble technique uh, with uh, decision trees that are underlying the, uh, the, the, the ensemble. It has a whole variety of parameters, and I encourage you to look back at the documentation. A, a few uh, of note, uh, we've talked about learning rate in the context of classification. This is a, a measure of uh, the total contribution that each tree can provide uh, to the function that's being represented. And, and so as that number gets smaller, we need more and more ensemble members in order to fill out the full function. And estimators, of course, is the uh, maximum number of uh, ensemble members. We can, as we're learning one ensemble member to the next, we can subsample the training set. And there's also a notion of validation fraction. This is the fraction of our samples that are provided to uh, the gradient boosting regressor during the fit process that it holds out uh, and it uses this to detect uh, overfitting. And if it does uh, detect overfitting, then it stops the training process, even if it hasn't reached the uh, total number of available uh, estimators. So if we're not careful, uh, and, and we'll do some examples along these lines, we can overfit the, the, the training data. Uh, the book has a little bit of code that, that shows you how to do this explicitly. We're going to use that validation fraction in our example to, to do that automatically. All right, it's time to turn to the code. All right, you have uh, in the Git repository, there is a skeleton file for you to, to work from. Uh, what I'm adding here is our gradient boosted regressor, and otherwise uh, everything else is uh, as we've been building up over our set of, uh, of notebooks. I've provided a data set also in the Git repository called gradient boosting data. I'm going to load that up. Uh, since it's one-dimensional data, I had to do a little bit extra reshaping in order to uh, get it into a form that's, uh, that's going to work with our models. In, in particular, it needs a two-dimensional shape. I'm also providing, this is new, this is a plot data function. Uh, this will allow us to look at the raw data points, and I'll show that to you here in just a second. But also, if uh, one provides a model, uh, then plot data will also uh, query the, the model for a range of input values and so that we can see how the model actually compares against the real data. So let's go ahead and, and make use of that. We have our inputs and our outputs. And there is our data set. So this actually looks a little bit like uh, the picture that I uh, drew in, in our examples, and that's uh, on purpose. The first thing I'd like to do is try just a single decision tree uh, regressor just to see what it is capable of doing. So that's a decision, decision tree regressor. And let's set max leaf nodes to a boring number of, uh, of two. That means exactly one question. Oh, and it's in the max leaf nodes. We'll fit our data. And I'm just going to fit to all of the available data for this uh, particular case. And there we go. We've we fit the data, and now we can plot our data, give it our ins and outs, and I can also hand it our model. I seem to be dropping S's now on my keyboard. There we go. Uh, so, so remember that this, had, this, this decision tree had just one question, so we have exactly two leaf nodes, 
and uh, there, there's the cut right there. Uh, and the, the average of all of the things on the left-hand side is, is right there. The average of everything on the right-hand side is, is at this level here. It's actually a lot like uh, the picture that we uh, drew uh, in, in our example. We can increase the number of leaf nodes. So let's go to three, and that will give us two questions. And, and you can see now it's partitioned. I'm sorry. Yeah, it'll give us two questions, three leaf nodes. So we have uh, three different uh, piecewise constant levels uh, here. So the next best split was uh, out here near 1.5. And, and we can keep going with this. Let's go to four. And, and as we make this larger and larger, it, it will start to fill in a more complicated function. Here's uh, 10 leaf nodes. And sort of eyeballing this, this function, that, that might actually do a, a reasonable job uh, of capturing the trends. There, there are a few other details here that we might want it to handle, but let's just for fun, let's double the number of leaf nodes. And here now we're starting to pick up on some of the wiggles that may or may not be really in the data. So there's one example there. There's a couple of examples there. And, and then let's go to the extreme here. Go to 100 leaf nodes, which is probably exceeding the number of data points. It is exceeding the number of data points. And here, essentially, we have one leaf node for every data point. So we're dramatically overfitting this function. Uh, and what this means is that we may not uh, do very well at predicting independent data. All right, so that's what one decision tree is capable of. Uh, but let's now move on to our ensemble. So we're going to call this boosting model. Gradient boosting regressor. And I'm going, and, and here it's not a wrapper class for an arbitrary regressor. It's specifically, the, the ensemble members are specifically decision tree regressors. So, so this class knows about the hyperparameters for the individual decision trees. So I'll set max leaf nodes to uh, three and n estimators. Two, so I'm going to make this uh, uh, very uh, small. And learning rate, uh, for the instant, I'm going to go ahead and set that to one. There we go. Let's uh, go ahead and fit it. And it's done the fitting process. And now we can plot our data. And, and there we go. So this, this captures something that looks a little bit like uh, a decision, an individual decision tree with a, a few leaf nodes. Uh, this learning rate parameter uh, really kind of tries to force more redundancy in the uh, different trees. If I set it to 0 0.5, what it means is that an individual tree can only contribute a fraction uh, of the value that is being uh, that is being uh, predicted by the ensemble. So it forces a, a certain degree of uh, of overlap uh, between the different trees, and in particular, we probably only had one tree sort of covering this area over here, and that's why we're sort of impoverished in our representation of this set of points here. If I make this even smaller, in fact, the, the default value is for the learning rate is 0.1. Uh, you'll, you'll see that the overall function is, is uh, uh, dropping in scale. 
So now let's go ahead and set it down to the, uh, well, we'll, we'll go ahead and set it to 0.1, which is that default value. And you can see now we've, uh, the, the overall scale of the function that, we re that we're representing is not very high. Okay, so in order to counteract that, uh, we need to increase the number of estimators. And, and again, we, we talked about this in the class of our case, there is that trade-off between the learning rate and the number of estimators. So, so you can see now uh, that range along the vertical axis has increased. And let's double this again. And, and you, can see, you can see now that we're starting to fill in reasonable uh, range of values along that vertical axis. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, move this up to 50. And, uh, and, and at, that at this point, we're actually starting to fill in some more of the, the lower level uh, details. Um, so capturing this extra little hump here, uh, capturing some of these uh, these details, um, we're probably in starting to introduce some some funny discontinuities, but that's uh, but that's okay. For fun, let's go ahead and increase number of estimators again by a factor of two, and uh, now we're starting to capture the uh, the overall function, even this uh, far corner here. If, if you look carefully, we're, we're starting to uh, capture features that may or may not be in the data. So there's one case there, there's a little case right there. Uh, these little wiggles here may or may not be uh, in the real underlying function. Let's go ahead and, and increase number of estimators again by a factor of two, and, and that our overfit should start to be much more uh, evident. So you, so you can now see that we have a lot of wiggles uh, in the function along uh, almost every step of, along the way here. We've got some substantial uh, wiggles along in, in there. So, so we've definitely stepped into the territory where we're beginning to overfit. And, and we saw this also with our more complicated decision trees. But what's interesting is that the underlying decision trees, they only have uh, three leaf nodes at, at best. Let's go ahead and increase that to see whether that changes anything. Um, that sort of exacerbates the, the overfitting problem. Let's explicitly try to combat this. So the way we've actually set up the, the parameters so far, we're forcing it to use uh, 200 ensemble members, with uh, each with up to five leaf nodes. Whether or not all of those are being used, it's, it's unclear, but we're def we definitely are forcing it to have 200 uh, estimators. Now, as we talked about at the beginning of this, um, we can actually do some regularization, and uh, we can do that in a variety of ways. Uh, one way to do that is to use uh, this validation fraction parameter. And I'm going to set that pretty small to 0.1. And in order to use that, you also have to set n iter no change to some positive integer. The default value is uh, none. Uh, what what this this pair of parameters says is uh, we're going to hold out a subset of the of our training set. In fact, we're going to hold out a subset of 10%. Uh, and we're going to ask what the performance is on that validation data set and, and, and chart that as we add more and more uh, individual ensemble members. And once that performance uh, with respect to the validation set stops changing for five uh, five steps, five, meaning five uh, additions of ensemble members, then uh, we're going to stop early. So, uh, so we might reach a total number of uh, 200 uh, uh, ensemble members, but we could potentially stop a lot earlier. 
All right, so let's go ahead and execute that. And, uh, and as you can see, now those, uh, those wiggles that we were kind of concerned about uh, have actually uh, disappeared. There's a, actually a tiny wiggle right there that we might be concerned about, but, uh, but this model has, uh, the, the, the resulting model is actually capturing the general trend of the data and not the noise that's imposed in, in the data. It'd be kind of nice if we kind of went a little bit higher there. It'd be nice if we sort of distinguished uh, this set of data here from what's going on over here, uh, but uh, it's actually doing a, a reasonable job. We don't actually have a whole lot of training samples here, so uh, even holding out 10% uh, starts to get a little bit sketchy, especially down uh, on this side here. Um, so one has to be a bit cautious about that. So we can actually cut this off. We can cut this off a little bit earlier. I doubt that's going to make much of a change in the function that we're representing. So if I were to say set the n estimators up to a thousand, you'll notice that uh, we haven't really uh, changed the shape of our function. It's it's definitely different, but uh, the overall complexity of the function hasn't changed. Uh, very much, and, and that's indicative of the fact that we're uh, cutting off our training process early. And likewise, actually, let's ask the question of what happens when we double the number of leaf nodes. And, and here, again, the, the general trend is, is still in place. Uh, the complexity is about the same. So, so by doubling the capabilities of the individual decision tree elements, uh, we're probably making use of a much smaller uh, number of ensemble members. All right, so that's a, a quick demonstration of gradient boosted regression. There are lots of implementations out there on the net. Uh, one of the very popular ones is called XGBoost, that stands for extreme boosting. Uh, there are, uh, C++ and I believe MATLAB implementations as well as Python implementations of this. Uh, this is considered one of the, the standards uh, for doing uh, gradient boosting. And, and one of the nice things about it is that it's e extremely efficient uh, and it can handle uh, data in a variety of different forms, including uh, censored data. It, it actually naturally handles that in the implementation. Um, but this particular implementation that's built into scikit-learn, as we, as we can see, actually does quite well.